Love it or hate it, Star Trek Generations has a very important place in the canon of the franchise. Namely, is that we get the Next Generation crew on the big screen and we get Kirk taking a wee tumble off a bridge. Now, however you feel about the film, there is no denying it's a seriously interesting effort. I am Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture and here are 20 things you didn't know about Star Trek Generations Part 1. Number 20. Gene Roddenberry was firmly opposed to a TOS TNG team up. Generations was the first Trek movie to be produced following the death of creator Gene Roddenberry in 1991, and given Roddenberry's obstinate approach to deciding which stories could and couldn't be told, the creatives decided to push forward with bold new ideas following his death. One such concept was the creative team's suggestions of a movie that teamed the original series cast up with the Next Generation roster, to which Roddenberry had previously expressed firm opposition. While it'd be easy for fans to view such posthumous chicanery as disrespectful, especially so soon after Roddenberry's death, considering the man's reputation for being being stubborn, difficult, and slow to accept change, there was shockingly little outcry. Plus, how could any card-carrying Trekkie hear about a Kirk Picard team-up and not get excited? Number 19. Paramount allowed it to go 40% over budget. The budgets of the Star Trek movies have been all over the map, and though Generations era bridging premise was an easy sell to even the most casual Trek fan, Paramount nevertheless wanted to keep the budget tight. The initial budget proposal was set at just over $30 million, slightly above Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country's $27 million price tag, with the extra costs largely incurred by planning shoots in Hawaii, Idaho, and the Midwestern United States. But Paramount ended up nixing some of the location shoots to get the budget down to a svelte $25 million. However, production over Coverages and the necessity to spend an extra $5 million reshooting Kirk's death following poor test reactions bloated the budget out to $35 million. All in all, Generations went 40% over budget, though Paramount were smart enough to know that it was worth throwing extra cash at something as important as Kirk's death, even if in the eyes of many fans, they ultimately still whiffed it. Number 18. Why the uniforms are totally random. Fans often question why the Starfleet crew throughout the film are wearing combinations of costumes from the Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, with seemingly no explanation or even basic consistency whatsoever. The reason for this is that new uniforms had actually been designed for the Enterprise D's crew, which would have included minor military-style variations on the Next Generation's uniforms, including coloured collars matching the rest of the outfit, rank pips on the shoulder, and rank braiding along the wrist. Ultimately, producer Rick Berman wasn't a fan, so all of the changes were scrapped save for new angular combinations badge design. This decision occurred late enough in production that Jonathan Frakes and LeVar Burton were forced to borrow costumes from Deep Space Nine's Avery Brooks and Colomini, which naturally didn't fit so well. Though there sadly aren't any surviving images of the planned new uniforms, the call was made too late to prevent a series of Playmates action figures based on the designs being produced and released. Number 17. The Saucer Crash Landing was originally written for TNG's Season 6 cliffhanger ending. One of the most spectacular moments in the movie is the crash landing of the Enterprise's saucer section, which impacts into the jungle on the planet Viridian 3. As unforgettable as it is, the sequence was actually originally written for the Next Generation's Season 6 cliffhanger, Descent Part 1, but the SFX team insisted that they would struggle to execute the scene to the satisfaction on a TV budget, so recommended that it be saved for the film. And so, that's precisely what happened, with co-writer Brannon Braga holding on to the idea and finding a way to slot it into Generations. Given that the sequence's VFX are impressively well-aged for the most part, it's absolutely the right call to hang on and wait for the money to match the scale of the idea. Number 16. Paramount requested Carol Marcus's removal from the script. The film's original script included a part for Captain Kirk's historic love interest, Dr. Carol Marcus, B.B. Besh. For while Kirk and Marcus were long estranged by this point, Generation's novelization presented them as friends, albeit not without Kirk making one more attempt to rekindle things. Paramount execs ended up requesting that Carol be removed from the script, though with the film's co-writer Ronald D. Moore explaining that the studio was worried about audiences getting confused by Carol's reappearance. Instead, Kirk gets settled with the veritable non-character of Antonia, Lynn Salvatore, a woman scared scarcely seen throughout the film and to whom the audience has no emotional attachment whatsoever. In a movie that has to explain the nexus to audiences, worrying about Carol causing confusion is very much besides the point. Number 15. The Next Generation cast shot their scenes four days after wrapping the series. 
Generations was actually shot in conjunction with the final episodes of The Next Generation, resulting in a hectic production where principal photography was completed in just 51 days, a frankly impossibly short length of time on a modern Star Trek film. To add to the stress, filming began less than eight months before the movie was due to hit cinemas, which again, for any contemporary blockbuster, is an absurd turnaround time. The scenes that didn't require The Next Generation's cast members were filmed first while they wrapped up production on the series, and just four days after wrapping on the show, they headed over to a separate soundstage to start filming the movie. From the moment TNG's cast finished working on the series, there was a mere six months to go until Generations was due to release. That is what you call pressure. Number 14. Spock, Bones and Sulu were originally meant to appear. Ultimately, only three of the original series crew appear in the film, Kirk, Scotty and Chekhov, though Spock, Bones and Sulu were originally meant to show up. For starters, Leonard Nimoy was invited to both play Spock and direct the film, but felt that the film didn't give him anything to do, and so his lines were largely given to Scotty instead. In the case of DeForest Kelly, it was sadly down to the actor's ailing health, meaning he couldn't receive on-set insurance required to shoot any scenes, resulting in his dialogue being given to Chekhov. George Takei was called back to command the Enterprise B, but refused on the grounds that serving under Kirk again would require Sulu's rank to be reduced. Instead, his daughter Demora was introduced and given most of his lines. Sadly, some of the cast weren't informed about the original series cast members' absences, such as as Whoopi Goldberg, who arrived on set expecting to share a screen with Nichelle Nichols. Number 13. Numerous shots were recycled to save money. Because Paramount was desperately attempting to save money during the production, they ended up recycling expensive spaceship shots from previous Trek movies and TV. Most infamously, shots of the Klingon Bird of Prey, namely its destruction, were lifted from Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, having only been released three years earlier. Also, some shots of the Enterprise D were simply reused from the next generation. Are these things the end of the world? No, but they just make it clear just how eager Paramount was to cut corners, even if it made the production seem a little lazy and shoddy to fans eagle-eyed enough to notice. The Bird of Prey explosion is especially unforgivable. Just imagine a new MCU movie trying to get away with recycling one of its many distinctive shots from a few years ago. Number 12. An early concept involved the two Enterprise crews fighting. One of the earliest concepts for Generations involved having the two generations of Enterprise crews battle one another. Co-writer Ronald D. E. Moore said, We were obsessed with the poster image of the two Enterprises locked in combat. Kirk versus Picard, one must die. In terms of an image that would easily sell to fans, Moore certainly wasn't wrong, but unsurprisingly, problems quickly arose when the writers attempted to develop the idea further. Namely, what event could possibly bring Kirk and Picard into deathly conflict? As Batman v Superman proved a few years ago, the circumstances that could make two beloved heroes fight tend to be a bit contrived and unconvincing at best. While seeing the two Enterprises fire on one another or Kirk and Picard throw down would have generated thermonuclear levels of fan service, would it have actually made a lick of sense? Number 11. Kirk's death was spoiled before it was even shot. Those script leaks are infinitely more disastrous today where everyone has a portable camera equipped computer in their pocket. There weren't exactly a picnic three decades ago either. By March 1994, when Generations was just starting principal photography, a script had been leaked in fan circles and online, revealing both the film's energy ribbon conceit and, most alarmingly, the death of Kirk. To make matters worse, Scotty actor James Doohan confirmed the script's legitimacy at a fan convention that very same month, causing his presumably panicked agent to claim that he had hadn't actually seen the completed script. In September 1994, some two months before Generations was due to release, another copy leaked online, ensuring the fandom was well aware of what was coming before it happened. Hilariously, Paramount delayed the release of the film's musical score until three weeks after the movie hit cinemas to protect against spoilers, what with one of the climactic tracks being bluntly called Kirk's Death. Could they really not have just named the track something else? Part 2. Number 10. It was the first film ever marketed with a website. Though the internet was certainly a thing by 1994, believe it or not, Generations is the first film in history to have its own official promotional website. The site, generations.viacom.com, went online three weeks prior to the movie's release and presented an interface in the style of the Enterprise's iconic Library Computer Access Retrieval System, Elgar's operating system. The site included a trailer for the film, sound clips and photos, behind-the-scenes materials and a Star Trek shop. For a short while, it was one of the most popular sites on the web, though unlike like other promotional websites of the era, such as the Space Jam site from 1996, which is still online today, it didn't stand the test of time and eventually disappeared into the cyber ether. Number 9. The novelization features the original ending and Kirk's funeral. 
The first edition of Generations novelization contains a number of ideas from earlier scripts that were ultimately discarded, as well as the original ending that was eventually reshot. The novel includes Kirk's original death where he's fatally shot in the back by Sauron, and then Sauron is killed when Picard shoots him with his own disruptor pistol. This edition also included Kirk's funeral, with a scene where Spock would hesitate to enter the church because it meant admitting that Kirk was really dead before Bones convinces him to enter. Soon enough, a second edition of the novelization was released, which was more movie faithful, especially with regards to Kirk's demise. Number 8. Data uses profanity to avoid a G rating. It's of course no secret that the vast majority of blockbuster movie releases aim for a PG-13 rating, because a more adult-skewing R rating can be incredibly risky where larger budget material is concerned. But there's also a fascinating, largely unspoken phenomenon that goes the other way, whereby studios prefer to avoid their bigger budget live-action movies getting a mild G rating because it has historically stunted the box office of films that aren't strictly family-friendly. G gives the impression that a film is harmlessly inoffensive to all, and in the context of Star Trek that might imply it's toothless and sanitized to a fault, and so the decision was made to include a single piece of profanity to boost it to a PG rating, where Data memorably says, Oh sh as the Enterprise takes a dive. Ultimately, only one more Trek film after this, Insurrection, was rated PG, with a franchise deferring to the blockbuster typical PG-13 from that point onwards. First Contact, sandwiched in between these two movies, was the first PG-13 entry in the franchise. Number 7. The death of Picard's family was Patrick Stewart's suggestion. One of the most memorable aspects of Generation's plot is the revelation that Picard's brother Robert and his nephew René died in a fire, though Picard's anguish was originally considerably less dramatic than this. The script initially had Picard learn that his brother had died of a heart attack while in his vineyard, but Patrick Stewart suggested that the news had to be more dire and upsetting than this by extending to the future of his family name. Further still, Stewart also said that it had to be harsh, unpleasant means of death, hence the fire. To Stewart's credit, he absolutely commits to the heartbreak of these scenes deepening Picard's characterization as a result. Number 6. Captain Harriman's family are a Ferris Bueller easter egg. Enterprise B Captain John Harriman would never rank among anyone's favourite Trek captains, but it's probably not entirely fair to disparage him with such a brief amount of screen time, especially when he's commanding an understocked ship, wasn't expecting anything beyond a gentle cruise, and has to deal with the abject stress of Kirk watching him work. But one of the most amusing nuggets of information about an otherwise bland and uninteresting character comes from Harriman's personal file in the 1998 video game Star Trek Starship Creator. The file mentions that Harriman has a wife named Sloane and a son named Ferris, who both live in Chicago, as well as interests in 20th century Italian sports automobiles. This is, of course, all a big cutesy reference to actor Alan Rook's much-loved role as Cameron in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and while the canonicity of this file can perhaps be disputed, does anything in Harriman's brief screen time actually contradict it? Nope. Number 5. Reshoots were completed just weeks before release. The film's massively rushed production schedule was exacerbated by the fact that crucial reshoots had to be conducted in October of 1994, literally weeks before it opened. The scene where Picard is in the Nexus and imagines himself at home with his family was shot in an actual house in California, while the initial shoot occurred in May 1994 along with principal photography. The crew had to return there five months later to add Picard's nephew René to the scene. While these reshoots obviously weren't technically complex, as they didn't require much, if anything, in terms of VF Effects, the production was still cutting it massively fine to get the picture locked and completed before the release date. Number 4. Kirk can be saved in the video game ending. A video game based on the movie and bearing the very same title was released for PC in May 1997, some six months after Generation's movie sequel First Contact had actually been released. The game was a first-person shooter which touted the novel feature of allowing players to effectively save Kirk's life and prevent his controversial demise. While you can have things play out as in the movie if you so wish, you're also able to capture Sauron before he visits Viridian 3 and defeat his starship, preventing the Enterprise D's destruction and in turn negating Kirk's death. In this scenario, Kirk isn't actually involved in the game's story and is presumed to simply remain safe and happy within the Nexus. Number 3. The Nexus gave Guinan her sixth sense in an early draft. 
A fascinating element of Generation's story that was frustratingly removed from the script is the implication that when Guinan enters the Nexus along with some of the other Elorians in 2293, this is responsible for developing her famous sixth sense to see beyond the bounds of time and space. This, of course, runs counter to the assertion of fans in the next generation that it's a trait common to all the Elorians, but it's backed up by the movie's companion comic book, which similarly mentions that Guinan was fundamentally changed by her brief stint in the Nexus. It's certainly one of the film's more interesting story ideas, and so quite a frustrating exclusion. Number two, William Shatner wrote a sequel novel, Fixing Kirk's Death. Following the overwhelmingly negative fan response to Kirk's death, more the nature of it than the actual death itself, William Shatner decided to write his own sequel novel, The Return, with fellow scribes Garfield Reeve Stevens and Judith Reeve Stevens. Published in April 1996, the novel saw the Romulans align with the Borg to bring Kirk back to life using alien technology, before implanting false memories in his mind to turn him against Picard and the crew of the Enterprise. In the end, Kirk is broken free of his conditioning and sacrifices himself to destroy the Borg, but given that Spock can still sense him via their mind meld, he doesn't really believe Kirk is dead. It's in many ways a more satisfying send-off for Kirk than Generations, except that the next entry in the Shatnerverse series of novels, 1997's Avenger, swiftly confirms Kirk's survival thanks to a lucky last-minute transporter beam-out. Number one, the Nexus Energy Ribbon was an extremely complicated effort. Despite the aforementioned budget cuts, many of the movie's visual effects have actually aged pretty well, such as the Nexus's beautiful but terrifying energy ribbon. Director David Carson has famously called the energy ribbon the true villain of the movie, due to the enormous time and general resources its creation expended during the hurried production. Due to there being no direct frame of reference for the ribbon in nature, Industrial Light and Magic had to conceptualise it themselves, with legendary effects supervisor John Knoll modelling aspects of the ribbon from magnetic fields around Uranus and electrical storms. It's incredibly easy to take such effects for granted today, but back in the early days of complex CGI, stuff like this was just massively a headache. The end result was well worth it, at least. And we have come to it at last. It is the film that proved that the Next Generation crew really could handle a big screen budget and some big screen adventure. Now, whether we are following Jean-Luc Picard on his insane quest to smash every piece of glass that he finds, or Riker's quest Quest to figure out what was that third seat originally for in the cockpit of the Phoenix. It is the big film of 1996. I'm not going to lie to you. I've got very happy memories of this film. Is it a perfect film? No, no, it isn't. Is it a terrible film? No. No, it isn't. Is it a film that I shockingly, with my father, found myself in the middle of when the screen turned off and suddenly we were all given a bathroom break? Yes, yes it is. That was very surprising. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Bathroom break in the middle of a two hour film. Hey, listen, I wasn't about to turn it down. That is just one of the many things you probably didn't know. So with that in mind, I am Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture and here are 20 things you didn't know about Star Trek First Contact Part 1. Number 20, it had a considerably bigger budget than Generations. First Contact's final budget was set at $45 million, making it the most expensive film in the franchise up to that point, tied with the very first film in the series, Star Trek The Motion Picture. After the release of The Motion Picture, the sequels received considerably smaller budgets, with First Contact's predecessor originally priced at a slender $25 million before reshoots and overages pushed it to 35. million. First Contact having $10 million more to play with allowed the production team to plan and stage more elaborate effects-driven action sequences, as ultimately became a large part of the movie's mainstream appeal. Its subsequent box office success prompted Paramount to drop a stonking 70 million on the direct sequel, Star Trek Insurrection, which wasn't nearly as well received either critically or commercially. Number 19, Picard and Riker's planned roles were swapped. In earlier drafts of the script, the plot roles assigned to Captain Picard and Riker were actually reversed. Picard would remain on Earth to help with the Phoenix's historic warp drive flight, while Riker would fight the Borg aboard the Enterprise. As a result, the bulk of the earlier drafts were focused on Earth, which Patrick Stewart reportedly objected to, resulting in Picard and Riker's arcs being switched around. This explains why Picard assumes a more action-centric role in this film. It was originally written for Riker, while Picard was supposed to replace Zephram Cochran in launching the Phoenix after the Borg puts Cochran in a coma. Number 18. It it almost took place in medieval Europe. 
As soon as writers Brannon Braga and Ronald D. Moore committed to the idea of a time travel movie, they began tossing around potential settings and settled on one distinct time period, medieval Europe. This version of the story, aptly entitled Star Trek Renaissance, would have revolved around the Borg attempting to prevent the development of modern civilization in the 15th century Europe. The Borg's base would have been an ornate castle that would have been half assimilated, there would have been sword fight sequences, and Data would end up as Leonardo da Vinci's apprentice. Ultimately, Moore felt that the idea risked becoming too campy the more they dug into the bones of it, and Patrick Stewart refused to wear tights, so the concept was scrapped. While it does sound a little Bill and Ted all in all, it could have been a lot of fun. Number 17. The Borg were given a big budget redesign. Budgetary constraints meant that the crew of The Next Generation weren't totally happy with how the Borg looked on the show, but First Contact's beefier budget allowed them to take the intended design much further, and retain the costumes and sets for later use on Star Trek Voyager. The makeup team's process for Borg actors on the movie took five times as long compared to The Next Generation, as they opted for a more visceral and involved look that better conveyed how thoroughly an assimilated person is subsumed by the Borg. Once shooting was complete for the day, it reportedly took a Borg actor two hours to get out of the elaborate costume and remove all of their makeup. Number 16. Zephram Cochrane is greeted by Spock's great grandfather. The Vulcan captain of the Tiplana Hath, who crucially greets Zephram Cochrane and initiates first contact, is never named in the movie itself or its end credits, though it's stated in a Star Trek card game and also a reference book that it is in fact Solkar, Spock's great grandfather. We first hear mention of Solkar way back in Star Trek 3 The Search for Spock, when he's named as the father of Skone and the grandfather of Sarek, Spock's own father. Fan service of this sort is tricky and often ends up confusing or enraging fans, but in this case, it's a meaningful addition that's just subtle enough to pass by more casual observers. Number 15. Q appeared in a draft of the script. There's no denying how much fans love Q, and so it's little surprise he almost wound up in First Contact, having been part of one of the script's earlier drafts. There's no word on precisely what his role might have entailed, but his presence surely would have dovetailed neatly into the time travel plot. Yet, the decision was ultimately made to exclude him, potentially due to the script already having so many spinning plates to keep track of. A Q cameo is rarely a bad thing, and Paramount was reportedly angling hard for the character's inclusion, but it never came to pass. It would have been neat, but it's not like the end result suffered at all due to his absence. Number 14. Geordie's visor was replaced at LeVar Burton's request. Geordie LaForge ditched his iconic visor from the next generation in this movie, switching it out for ocular implants which aren't given any further explanation. The change was actually suggested by actor LeVar Burton himself, who for years had been lobbying to get rid of the visor, feeling that it encroached upon his performance due to his lack of eyesight, and that preventing the audience from seeing his eyes lessened their emotional connection to him. Co-writer Moore eventually complied and came up with the implants, which Geordie continued to wear for the remainder of his cinematic Trek tenure, bar that subplot and insurrection where his eyes temporarily regenerate. Number 13. It was the last Trek film to use practical models. First Contact marked a major milestone for the Star Trek movies by being the final one to use a practical scale model of the Enterprise during production. Most of the shots of the Enterprise throughout the film were achieved through practical motion control photography, with the model being filmed and then inserted into a CGI environment or enhanced with digital effects. From Star Trek Insurrection onwards, the various effects shot of the ships were entirely digital, initially working from high resolution images of the Enterprise model taken during production on Star Trek First Contact. Naturally, it goes without saying that the J.J. Abrams produced reboot franchise also opted for 100% CGI ships, given that VFX are considerably cheaper than practical elements these days. Number 12. The Borg eyepieces secretly flash Morse code. Each Borg drone, of course, wears an electronic eyepiece which could be seen periodically blinking red, but what you surely didn't realise is that these blinks were actually spelling out Morse code. Makeup designer Michael Westmore's son, Michael Westmore Jr., programmed the lights to spell out the names of various members of the film's production team. Though you'd struggle to make any of these names out given that a single Borg drone is rarely lingered upon for long, it's a most fascinating, peculiar easter egg for sure. Allegedly, some of the names included are producer Rick Berman, former Paramount CEO Sherry Lansing, and Michael Westmore's dog, Bonnie. Number 11. Shooting started just seven months before release. This fact is scarcely believable considering how polished and well-aged the movie is, but First Contact didn't start shooting until April 8th, 1996, just seven and a half months before the film ended up releasing in cinemas. This truncated production schedule, comprised of three months of shooting and almost five months of post-production, forced visual effects company Industrial Light & Magic to rush to complete the film's effects on time. The most complicated effect in the film, the Borg Queen's head being lowered onto her torso, alone took five months to satisfactorily finish. The 
prospect of a sci-fi tentpole film hitting cinemas less than five months after the last piece of principal footage is shot is absolutely mind-boggling to consider today, where it's not unheard of for glossy tentpoles to spend 18 months in post-production. Part 2. Number 10. The Norway-class ships never appeared again because the CGI files got lost or corrupted. First Contact depicts the Battle of Sector 001, in which Starfleet destroys the Borg Cube at considerable cost to their number. Among the vessels involved in the battle are a fleet of Norway-class Federation starships, which were designed, among others, by Industrial Light & Magic's longtime art director Alex Yeager. A year after the film's production, however, ILM asked Paramount to send them the CGI models for these ships for use in an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Season 6's Sacrifice of Angels, to be precise. And according to the show's VFX supervisor David Stipes, the files were rendered inaccessible for technical reasons. It's been heavily suggested that the Norway-class model data was either lost or corrupted at some point, explaining why the ships have never appeared in any other live-action Star Trek media, given the massive effort of reconstituting the entire model from scratch. Number 9. There was pre-release rumours about data being recast. Before First Contact's release, aggressive rumours did the rounds that the film would feature a subplot where Data's skin is removed by the Borg, leaving the door open for another actor to take up the role in the future. This rumour emerged amid concerns about an ageing Brent Spiner, who was seemingly no longer able to convincingly play the ageless android. And though the film does feature a sequence where the Borg Queen grafts human skin onto Data, it's only temporary. Given the iconic stature of Data and the utterly statuesque nature of Spiner's portrayal, this is one of those parts that just can't be recast, so thankfully the pre-release scuttlebutt was a load of bull. Number 8. The Borg Queen exists for one major reason. The Borg Queen actually didn't exist in earlier versions of the film's script, with the leader of the Borg being instead a central computer. Yet, it was eventually decided that both the movie's characters and the audience needed a more tangible villain to latch onto, as would make the central conflict more dramatic and cinematic. And so the Borg Queen came into existence, kickstarting a lengthy and challenging casting process whereby Jonathan Frakes attempted to find an actress who could be both intimidating and slyly sexy in the role. He certainly found that in Alice Krieg. Though she absolutely suffered for her art, receiving blisters from the tight costume and wearing painful silver contact lenses that she could only keep in her eyes for about four minutes at a time. Number 7. The Defiant was originally going to be destroyed. During the Battle of Sector 001, earlier script had Deep Space Nine's USS Defiant destroyed by the Borg, but concerns from several key Trek creatives caused this to be changed in later drafts. For starters, DS9 showrunner and executive producer Ira Stephen Bear took major exception that one of the series' ships was going to be flippantly destroyed in a film that didn't even feature DS9's main cast members. Writer Ronald D. Moore agreed with the destruction being unnecessary, so the decision was made to give the Defiant a stay of execution. All in all, though, the inclusion of the Defiant does feel like a little bit of a missed opportunity, a chroma fan service without the personnel who would have actually made it worthwhile. Number 6. The title was changed due to alien resurrection. The film went through many different titles before First Contact was settled on, including Star Trek Borg and Star Trek Resurrection. Though just about everybody was in agreement that Resurrection worked, it ended up getting thrown out after Paramount realised that Fox had already registered the name for use in their upcoming Alien sequel, Alien Resurrection. While First Contact was wrapped before Alien Resurrection had even started shooting and released more than a year earlier, it was in nobody's interest to create potential brand confusion among audiences, so the decision was made to name the film after an episode from the next generation's fourth season instead. Number five, it created a fan debate about the Enterprise E's deck count. As beloved as First Contact is among fans, it did generate a fiery debate about exactly how many damn decks there are on board the Enterprise E. In the movie, Picard explains to Lily Sloan that the ship has 24 decks, though just about five minutes earlier we hear Security Officer Lieutenant Daniels say it looks like the Borg controlled decks 26 up to 11. So how many damn decks are there? Complicating matters even further a few years on, Star Trek Nemesis sees both Worf and Geordi mention the Enterprise E having a 29th deck. There's sadly no real canon answer to this and so fans remain engaged in spirited discourse about it to this very day. It may not matter that much, but it's still an annoying oversight for sure. Number 4. Lieutenant Hawk was rumoured to be the first openly gay Star Trek character. 
Character actor Neil McDonough appears in First Contact as the doomed Enterprise helmsman Lieutenant Hawk, and while the film was being shot, there were persistent rumours that he would be revealed as the first openly gay Star Trek character. There's no sign of this in the final film, and both the filmmakers and McDonough himself have denied it. Curiously though, in the 2001 non-canon novel Section 31 Rogue, Hawk is indeed depicted as a gay man. While it's possible that authors Andy Mangles and Michael A. Martin were working from information they had about earlier drafts of First Contact, there's also little reason for the filmmakers or McDonough to lie about those earlier intentions for the character. It's far more likely that the writers heard about the rumours, then decided to incorporate them into their depiction of Hawk. In an interview, Mangle said of the decision, I found it frustrating and disappointing, not just as an openly gay writer, but also as a lifelong fan, that gays and lesbians had almost no representation in the future world of Star Trek. Just as Trek has over the decades been a beacon of hope for millions of minority racial, ethnic and philosophical groups who have had reason to worry about their future, it seems only fitting that Trek fans of varying sexual orientations got to share that optimism of a better and more inclusive world. Number 3. It was the first Star Trek film to receive a PG-13 rating. First Contact was the first Star Trek movie to receive a PG-13 rating from the MPAA, which reflected both the film's more menacing violence by way of the Borg, and of course the Borg Queen's undeniable sensuality. But the rating also reflected blockbuster cinema's increasing tendency to favour the PG-13 rating over PG, because it simply indicated a film more likely to appeal to both younger and older audiences. The previous film, Star Trek Generations, famously had to include Data dropping an S-bomb to prevent it from scoring a G rating, which would have unequivocally labelled it as a child-friendly movie and possibly dissuaded more mature viewers. Curiously, First Contact's follow-up Star Trek Insurrection went back to the PG rating, with perhaps an attempt to mitigate its larger budget ending up having the opposite effect. Those lured by the intensity of First Contact maybe found it a little too mild, hence its disappointing box office performance. As a result, Insurrection would end up being the last Trek movie not to be rated PG-13, and PG-13 is now standard for blockbuster films aiming to hit all four quadrants. Number 2. Voyager cameos were added in final script revisions. As much as fans were disappointed by the absence of any Deep Space Nine crew members, especially Captain Benjamin Sisko, who was heavily rumoured to appear, First Contact did compensate somewhat by including two cameos from Star Trek Voyager characters. Voyager's holographic Doctor makes a brief but amusing appearance as the Enterprise E's emergency medical hologram, a cameo which was suggested by Robert Picardo himself, who felt it would make sense for the technology in Voyager to appear in this film. Secondly, actor Ethan Phillips, who played Neelix on Voyager, makes an uncredited cameo as a nightclub maitre d' in the holodeck. It's easily missed if you're not familiar with Phillips' regular appearance, and according to Phillips himself, the producers wanted to leave eagle-eyed fans unsure if this character was Neelix or not. But these cameos were actually added late in pre-production when a third and final draft of the script was completed, adding some welcome interconnectedness between the movie and the then-airing Voyager. Number 1. A planned video game was scrapped mid-production. Publisher Microprose originally owned the video game rights to the next generation, and in 1997 released the poorly received tie-in for Star Trek Generations, inexplicably arriving two and a half years after the film's release. That year, however, Microprose also announced that an adaptation of First Contact was in the works, centred around the crew of the Enterprise fending off the Borg invasion. But financial difficulties caused the studio to shutter as it prepared to be acquired by Hasbro in 1998, and so the game was never completed. From that point, the rights to the franchise were snapped up by Activision, who skipped over over First Contact and, in 1999, released the insurrection tie-in Star Trek Hidden Evil to mixed reviews. Every once in a while, a film comes along that is both amazing, wonderful, and slightly forgettable. And sometimes that happens several times in the same franchise. We have some of the earlier Kirk films, and then we have Star Trek Insurrection. For all of the effort that went into this movie, a lot of love did go in, so did a hell of a lot of rewrites. We had the very first fully CGI version of the Enterprise E, some of which looks lovely. Emphasis on some. We also had some wonderful sonar ships that were lost to time until recently. Thank you very much, Eagle Moss. And we have an entire version of a script that was started by Michael Piller and then completely lost, chopped up and changed along the way. Thank you, Patrick Stewart. There's also, and I am not going to lie about this, Scenes that feature Armin Jiriman in full makeup as Quark in a swimsuit. And people say Insurrection isn't interesting. It may be the extra long TV episode that got turned into a film, but I will defend Star Trek Insurrection to the ground. With that in mind, I am Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are 20 things you didn't know about Star Trek Insurrection, part one. Number 20. Patrick Stewart didn't want television Picard to return. 
Patrick Stewart had felt a bit let down by the direction in which Star Trek Generations had taken his character. For him, he felt that Picard was far too much like his television self rather than a movie role. When Star Trek First Contact was released, he felt that the character achieved that movie star action hero status that he so wanted. Specifically, the scenes between himself and the Borg Queen and engineering helped to sway him. So, when the script for Insurrection came along, he was able to request additional changes be made so he wouldn't be going backward. This included the love story between Picard and Anish, along with the scenes featuring the evacuation of the Baku the deployment of the captain's yacht, and all of the scenes on the collector with Ruafo. Michael Piller said that for Picard to truly be the hero, he had to be morally and ethically in the right, even though he was effectively leading a mutiny against both Admiral Doherty and Starfleet itself. Number 19. The Kiss Got Cut one thing that is noticeably missing from the release of Star Trek Insurrection is an on-screen kiss between Captain Picard and Anish. The two characters have clearly been set up as a romantic couple, with this status earned as they attempt to save the Baku together, along with their eventual capture by the Sona. According to Patrick Stewart, a kiss was indeed filmed for the climax of the film. This would have been a more direct payoff than what the audience received, which was effectively a tease for a sequel that never materialised. Picard tells Anish that he has accrued almost a year of shore leave, which he intends to take with her. The kiss, according to Stewart, was cut by the studio for a reason he was not made aware of. Number 18. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Anthony Zerb plays Admiral Matthew Dougherty in the film, though he was actually considered originally for the role of Ardar Rawafo. Though he auditioned well, the role was given to F. Murray Abraham. As part of his audition, Zerb used his own unique style of acting to secure the part, including going completely off script. Rather than recite the lines as provided, he instead performed a chunk of Dante's Inferno. Only after he had completed these passages did he then switch back to the script as it was. This would prove to be a slightly apt decision, as Admiral Dougherty himself makes many bargains with the devil during his time in the film. Though it is all done for altruistic reasons, the Sona Alliance is one that is clearly about as secure as an alliance with the Borg. Number 17. Sorry, kill you next time. Brent Spiner was thoroughly done with the character of Data by the time Star Trek Insurrection rolled around. He had initially even been reluctant to appear in Star Trek Generations, though negotiations did go his way. He preferred the script for Star Trek First Contact as it allowed him a large range to act alongside Alice Krieg's Queen. By Insurrection, he was beginning to have concerns that aging out, feeling that it was beginning to stretch plausibility for him to play the ageless android. A couple of factors went into his agreeing to appear. First, he credited his then-girlfriend, who persuaded him that being the only holdout from the main cast be a decision he would go on to regret. The second reason was the handsome salary he received. Thirdly, he wrote a note to Rick Berman asking for Data to be killed in the movie. That way, he reckoned, no one would have to go through this process again for future film. However, when he received the script from Berman, it came with the note, sorry, kill you next time, and Data survived the events of the Briar Patch. Number 16. Can I interest you in a timeshare? There was a scripted scene involving Armin Zimmerman in the script for Star Trek Insurrection, which may have reached the filming stage as evidenced by the on-set photo of Quark in a bathing suit. However, the scene has failed to see the light of day. The script featured an exchange between Quark, Worf and Captain Picard. The Ferengi barman was to have approached them with the idea of building timeshares all along the lakefront, while two Dabo girls were perched on each arm. Picard bluntly states that there will be absolutely zero chance of that happening, ordering Worf to beam him to the Enterprise. Quark sulkily then says that the Nagus will be in touch. While the scene is a fun tie-in to the then-ongoing Deep Space Nine, it was deemed superfluous by the producers, as Worf himself was already a crossover with the series. Despite Quark's best efforts, the timeshares were cut from the film entirely. Number 15. Michael Piller was stuck in development hell before Rick Berman called him. Michael Piller had joined the Star Trek franchise as the next generation had gone into its third season, though when the time came for a script for Star Trek Generations, he turned it down. He recommended Brennan Braga and Ronald D. Moore to write that film instead. He had stepped back from Star Trek a bit by then, having been deeply involved in DS9 and Voyager as well. In the years between Generations and Insurrection, he had written several projects that he thought were quite strong, though there was one glaring issue with them. None of them had actually been produced. It was what the industry referred to as development hell, or in other terms, everyone really liked the pieces, but not quite enough to greenlight them. Rick Berman then called Piller, asking him if he would be interested in penning the script for the ninth Star Trek film. Piller accepted, and two years of a laborious process began. Number 14. Berman wanted an old David O. Selznick film to be the inspiration. During the brainstorming phase of writing the script, Rick Berman was intrigued with having the story resemble The Prisoner of Zenda. The original novel had been released in 1894 by Anthony Hope, with the Ronald Coleman and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. starring 1937 adaptation being a prime inspiration. In the story, a man discovers that there is another person out there who is almost identical to him, though is soon to be the leader of another state. Sound familiar? Star Trek Insurrection veered away from this storyline, though elements of it would resurface in Star Trek Nemesis. While Shinzon is clearly not a heroic character by any means, 
means he is still a clone of the Yout Lee protagonist and he is recently the head of the Romulan state. That's about the extent of the similarities between the Coleman film and the final Next Generation movie, but the inspiration can clearly be seen for Stuart Baird's offering to the franchise here. Number 13. Despite Spiner's reluctance, there could have been two androids in the film. Michael Piller toyed with the idea of bringing lore back to the franchise. He had last been seen in Descent Part 2, where he was shot by Data. Though disassembled, death was never truly certain for Data's brother, so a return could easily have been achieved. Piller took inspiration from Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan for this idea. Lore would have returned hell-bent on seeking revenge against both Data and the crew of the Enterprise E. While the exact reasons that this didn't progress into a story are a little vague, Spiner's reluctance to return to even the role of Data may have played a part. In a similar move to Berman's idea of having two cards, two Soon-type androids would appear in the following film. B4 is said to be a prototype android far less sophisticated than Data and certainly less advanced than Lore himself. While fans were disappointed that the evil twin didn't return, at least Spiner got to pull double duty one more time. Number 12. Roddenberry's Box when writing about the process by which Michael Piller was assigned the film, the writer spoke of the problem of Roddenberry's box, as he called it. This was the set of rules that each and every writer on Star Trek had to fight with when they came on board. Piller himself got first experience of this with the bonding. Back in TNG's third season, Ronald D. Moore submitted the bonding, an episode dealing with grief. Roddenberry flatly rejected it, as humans didn't grieve in his 24th century. Piller wrote that while many writers could and did balk at these kind of restrictions, he simply took it as a challenge and reworked the script. If there is one consistent complaint about Insurrection, it's that it feels like an extra long episode of Star Trek. In a way, this is completely accurate. Piller wrote the film with Roddenberry's box in mind, allowing the process to speed through the editors without the slog of trying to find new writers to take on the challenge. Number 11. Ira Stephen Bear and the Paper Tigers when Piller completed his third version of the script, he showed it to Ira Stephen Bear, who was the showrunner and executive producer on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. He handed the script straight back to Piller, calling the Sona a good idea, though describing them as paper tigers. A paper tiger is something that seems intimidating, frightening or even powerful, but is in fact far from it. The first version of the Sona effectively fell apart on the most casual of glances, leading them in desperate need of a rapid rewrite. Piller took the script back and began to work on it. The romantic subplot was added, though what was also added was the Collector, the massive ship that comes to harvest the energy of the rings upon which Picard and Ruafu have their final fight in the film. Though that final scene would undergo several treatments and even feature in an unaired ending, it was entirely missing from all early drafts of the script, which would have led to a rather interesting plot hole when it came time to collect that radiation. Part 2 of 20 Things You Didn't Know About Star Trek Insurrection Number 10. Patrick Stewart Held A Lot Of Sway On Star Trek Insurrection after returning to the film franchise as a producer as well as an actor this time around, Patrick Stewart was able to influence the story of the film. This didn't cause issues so much as it added a series of delays to pre-production. This was due mainly to his suggestions for story ideas. One of his ideas, that the crew of the Enterprise E defend the Baku village in the style similar to the Battle of the Alamo, was nixed from the film. It was deemed too logistically difficult and the original version of the villagers' flight into the hills was kept instead. The final version of the script was given to everyone bar Stewart, which made Rick Berman very nervous at this oversight. He worried that this would make the man feel deliberately excluded. Thankfully, the first that he heard about it was when LeVar Burton called him to praise the script. He called a meeting with Michael Piller, who attended nervously, but the only further notes were on several lines of dialogue. Number 9. The Pitch Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness is many things, but light it is not. So, when Rick Berman and Michael Piller chose to use it as a jumping off point for the film that they wanted to be lighter in tone than what had come before, this left people scratching their heads a little. To quote Piller, they knew it would be foolish to outborg the Borg and a curveball was needed to be thrown. In Heart of Darkness, a team is sent to retrieve a man who has gone mad in the jungle. In Heart of Lightness, as Piller jokingly called it, Picard is sent to retrieve a friend of his from the Academy. He has apparently turned mutineer against Starfleet and is attacking ships in the Briar Patch. When the Enterprise E arrives, they find that he looks exactly the same as Picard remembers him from all those years before. This was the same Fountain of Youth premise that evolved into the Baku planet itself. The idea of Picard's Academy friend melted away, though, eventually being replaced with a shady Starfleet Admiral instead. Number 8. It was the first Star Trek film that didn't use practical models. Star Trek Insurrection was the first film in which all of the space-based scenes in the franchise were achieved using CGI. Though a practical model of the Enterprise E had been constructed for Star Trek First Contact, it was not used in this film save for reference photos to build the CGI model. The Enterprise E is a mostly impressive construct, though the years have been a little unkind to it. At the time, it was cutting edge. It was designed by John Eves and built by Santa Barbara Studios, who also built the rest of the starships, the Sonar, the Scout Ship and the Captain's Yacht. However, 
However, they failed to archive the ships and they used their own software. The company has since gone out of business, which meant that the original designs were all but lost. They had also worked on elements of Deep Space Nine and Voyager, as well as the opening scene of the Enterprise B and the champagne bottle in Star Trek Generations. Number seven, the Sona were a calculated attempt to reach a younger demographic. The Sona, renamed from an earlier version that saw them called the Sony, appear in this film as the main villains. The first draft had featured the Romulans, who at that time had not yet appeared in the movie franchise as a primary antagonist. However, the producers went cold on them, with these new, younger villains taking their place. The Sona were hedonistic and loved life. A cut line from the script described them as loving wine, women and song. However, their obsession with enjoyment and the lost youth on the Baku planet led them to experiment with de-aging. The skin-stretching techniques were deliberate nods to plastic surgery culture. Ironically, this meant that the filmmakers wanted to cast younger actors and age them, which in turn, they believed, would attract younger audiences to the film. It had varying levels of success. The film did do well on its initial weekend and for a couple of weeks after, but then quickly dropped off. Number six, it was finally time for the crew to receive fancy new dress uniforms. The dress uniforms for the Next Generation crew were first introduced in the Season 1 episode, Lonely Among Us, serving as a variation of the regular coloured uniforms that the crew wore from week to week. This evolved, but only slightly, over the course of the show. For this film, costume designer Robert Blackman wanted to go slightly old school. His initial design for the Insurrection uniforms was inspired by old naval ideas. The first scene for the Next Generation crew in Star Trek Generations saw them in a literal navy uniform, and Blackman liked the blue jackets, shorter and trim. However, once he sat down to really think about it, he turned on the idea altogether. Next, he came up with a colour palette for the film. He believed that white on black would always pop, no matter the situation. Therefore, the white short jacket made its first appearance, sitting atop the high-waisted black trousers. The only real variation was that Picard wore an all-white variant, while the rest of the crew wore two-tone jackets. Number five, he's back, back, back again. Jerry Goldsmith to the rescue. Star Trek Insurrection was Jerry Goldsmith's fourth Star Trek score, and it reuses many of the themes that originated in the motion picture. The main Enterprise theme, along with the Klingon March, both make an appearance. So too does Alexander Courage's six-note motif. The soundtrack features a brand new theme for the Baku, no theme for the Sona. This was deliberate. Goldsmith wanted to include a cue in the score that the Sona and the Baku were the same race. Therefore, there is only an action cue that plays over their scenes, one interchangeable with the rest of the action music in the film. The Baku theme that appears in the first scene sets the the scene for the lighter tone of the film compared to Star Trek First Contact, with opened with a sinister rendition of what would become the Borg theme. The Baku theme then reappears at the end of the film as things have been set to rights again. This would be Goldsmith's second to last project for Star Trek as he would return for Star Trek Nemesis. Number four, a British tar is a soaring soul. There are a couple of conflicting accounts as to how Picard, Worf and Data ended up singing Gilbert and Sullivan in the final film. All agree that Picard had to distract Data long enough for the other two to capture him. One suggestion had Picard and Data quoting King Lear rather than singing altogether. This would call back to episodes of The Next Generation, while also serving as a nod to Stewart's Shakespearean pedigree. However, Stewart claimed he was against it. He then said that he suggested something like Tony Bennett, which would give Brent Spiner a chance to show off his tenor. Berman and Pillar felt that it was corny, and Stewart says that Pillar's suggested Gilbert and Sullivan, while Pillar stated that it was the other way around. Both men agree, however, that Stewart was not a fan of the composers. Despite his misgivings, Stewart agreed to HMS Pinafore after his first idea, Three Little Maids, was shot down for being too vulgar. Once he saw the finished product, he admitted that, in the end, Berman and Pillar had made the right call after all. Number three, A Beautiful Sunrise. There is one scene in Star Trek Insurrection that stands out, which is of course the sunrise scene featuring Geordi the Forge using his new eyes for the first time. Though the character had managed to ditch the visor in Star Trek First Contact, this scene marked one of the very few times that LeVar Burton got to appear without any prosthetics or appendages over his eyes in Star Trek. The scene was included not to make LeVar Burton's life any easier, but to make Captain Picard's life more difficult. Rick Berman initially wasn't sold on the idea of having the Forge's eyes regenerate, feeling that it was a little too heavy on the emotional side of things. However, Killer managed to argue his case successfully. He felt that if Picard had to make the choice of asking his officer to give up his eyes, it would help give him a bit of pause, but that ultimately he would decide to go ahead with saving the Baku, thus giving him an even greater ethical and moral standing. Once the script was shown to Berman as finished and the rest of the executives, they all agreed that it was one of the best scenes in Star Trek Insurrection. Number two, the original ending. 
Michael Piller had serious concerns about the first ending of the script, as he felt it was too similar to the ending of Star Trek Generations. Both films came to a close with Picard fighting the villain in hand-to-hand -hand combat, along with both films featuring the villain dying at the controls of their own weapons. The original version of The Collector also saw a device shot into a star rather than the rings. Piller changed the weapon's target and then switched the circumstances of Ruafo's death. Most importantly, there is a moment before the character's death that sees Picard extend a hand to help him escape, only for them to realise a moment too late that there's too great of a physical distance between them. Ruafo would then be on board the injector as it harnesses the radiation from the rings, growing younger and younger until fading into nothing. This version was shot, but only to be replaced with a more action-centric ending eventually featured in the film, something closer to the generation's ending after all. Number 1. The test audience loved the humour and killed that ending. Michael Piller recalled being extremely nervous as test screenings began. The audience had been pulled together from various street corners and pavements in Los Angeles and represented a mix of both Star Trek fans and those who weren't familiar with the franchise. Piller sat there knowing that it would not score as well as First Contact had, but still hoped for the best. He relaxed as the film went on, as the audience seemed to be enjoying the humour of the piece. When the screening was over, Piller felt that it went really well. The executives did not. They felt that the film's pacing was completely off. They also felt that there was no sufficient climax to the film. This was a belief shared by the test audience. Although they did like Picard's romance, Roafo's final fate, though still in its early stages of post-production effects, was immediately scrapped, as several members of the audience weren't even sure that he had died or not. With barely any time to spare, several million dollars were dropped on reworking the ending. The film's budget came in at roughly $70 million, and it went on to gross about $117 million. This was lower than both generations and First Contact, though still high enough to greenlight Star Trek Nemesis. I wonder how that one went. Well, my friends, the time has come. It was something we put off for as long as we possibly could, but no, 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 Nemesis is here. Listen, I will defend some parts of this film. There are very interesting stories behind the scenes, and it's entirely unfair what happened to Tom Hardy after the release of this film. I mean, it wasn't his fault. He didn't write it. For, however, the very legitimate problems that there are with Star Trek Nemesis, think of the positives. We have those beautiful new scimitar designs, and of course the Warbird designs, even though I do miss Andrew Probert's Warbird a lot. But anyway, we have that beautiful score from Jerry Goldsmith, which would of course unfortunately be his final act for Star Trek before he passed away. There are wonderful scenes, including the wedding, there's the return of Wesley Crusher, even if it's a blink and you'll miss it cameo, there's of course, there's Guinan, there is so much. So what the hell went wrong? I'm Sean Ferry for Trek Culture, and here are 20 things you didn't know about Star Trek Nemesis Part 1. Number 20. Patrick Stewart originally played both Picard and Shinzon. Though Tom Hardy, of course, ended up playing the part of the villainous Riemann leader and Picard clone Praetor Shinzon, the very first version of the script actually had Shinzon being portrayed by Patrick Stewart as a more direct, older clone of Picard. There sadly aren't any further details available online about how this would have changed the story, though it's fair to assume that Nemesis would have climaxed with Patrick Stewart effectively battling himself. Ultimately, the potential for goofiness would have been extremely high had they gone this route, so bringing in a young actor to portray a younger clone was probably the right call. However, a few years Years ago, a curious fan cleverly deep faked Stewart into the role of Shinzon to give fans a speculative glimpse of how it could have turned out. Number 19. Brent Spiner wanted Data to die for one specific reason. Data actor Brent Spiner actually helped write Data's arc for the movie, in turn earning the single writing credit of his entire career to date. Though John Logan is credited as Nemesis' sole screenwriter, Spiner received a story by credit. Spiner had been lobbying for many years, at least since the days of First Contact, for Data to be killed off, and so conceived a storyline for Nemesis where he would sacrifice himself to save Picard and blow up Shinzon's scimitar. Spiner's reasoning for wanting Data to die was simply as he felt he had aged too much, and that it made no sense for Data to be so noticeably advanced in years, being an android and all, and so Data died in Nemesis, albeit with the door being left ajar for him to return through his android brother, B4. In the end, much of Star Trek Picard's first season was ultimately concerned with tying off Data's arc seemingly once and for all. Number 18. Numerous legacy characters almost had cameos. Nemesis memorably features a fleeting cameo from Voyager's Captain Janeway as Vice Admiral Janeway, who briefly interacts with Picard in a video call, but several other peripheral Star Trek characters were intended to make cameo appearances in varying capacities. Most prominently, Seven of Nine was written a role in the film, and according to Jerry Ryan herself, it was intended to be a substantial supporting part rather than a quick wink-wink cameo. Ryan turned it down, though, because she wanted to take a break from her busy schedule working on Boston Public, and also felt that the part never rose above being pure fan service. 
Rose. She also turned down an offer to cameo at Riker and Troy's wedding because she again felt it didn't make any sense for Seven to be there. Elsewhere, Ashley Judd's Starfleet ensign Robin Leffler, a minor character who had appeared in two episodes of The Next Generation's fifth season, was written into an early draft, but it never panned out. And finally, Denise Crosby lobbied producer Rick Berman to bring Tasha Yar's half-Romulan daughter Sela back into the fold somehow, but the writers never found a way to work her into the movie. Number 17. Director Stuart Baird clashed with the cast. It's been frequently reported that many cast members ended up clashing with director Stuart Baird, who wasn't particularly familiar with Star Trek before shooting started, yet producer Rick Berman felt he would bring a fresh energy to the flagging franchise. LeVar Burton and Marina Sirtis have since spoken disparagingly of Baird, Burton claiming that Baird often referred to him as Laverne on set, and Sirtis calling him an idiot. There were also reports that Baird was clueless enough about Trek that he thought Geordi was an alien. Bloody hell. Though Jonathan Frakes was more diplomatic, he did speak about how he would have directed the film differently namely shifting the focus away from Shinzon and more towards the TNG cast. On the film's Blu-ray commentary, it's abundantly clear that Baird wasn't exactly happy with how the movie came out either, namely the enormous creative restrictions placed upon him throughout the process. Such is the nature of working on a gargantuan movie. Number 16. Wesley Crusher originally had a speaking role. One of the odder things about Nemesis is the blink and you'll miss it cameo from Wesley Crusher, which can be seen momentarily at Riker and Troy's wedding, yet he strangely doesn't say a word. This is because most of Wesley's role was cut during editing. On the movie's DVD, there's a brief scene at the wedding after Picard's toast where he speaks with Wesley, who's preparing to run the engineering night shift on the USS Titan, serving alongside Riker and Troy. It's a small moment, but like so many other deleted scenes in Nemesis, added welcome shade and character to a film that was so thoroughly lacking in it. Fans would have loved to have seen Wesley chatting with Picard again after years apart, but alas, Baird made the bizarre decision to leave this short exchange on the cutting room floor. Number 15. Riker's back hair was removed with CGI. CGI sure is capable of incredible things, eh? Well, it played a major role in one of Nemesis's most infamous and oft ridiculed scenes, the sex scene between Riker and Troy, which is interrupted by the extremely egregious and inappropriate scene of Shinzon's attempted mental rape of Troy. Because much of the scene focuses on Riker's back, the filmmakers asked Jonathan Frakes to shave his back for a more aesthetically pleasing visual, but he refused. And so, it fell to VFX Company to do the work instead, giving Riker's back a digital shave and to be fair, you'd never even know it, even though it's tough to believe that somebody actually cared this much about Riker having a tufty back. Number 14. Marina Sirtis almost didn't return. As much as she's an integral member of the TNG crew, Deanna Troy almost ended up being conspicuously absent throughout Nemesis, due to negotiations breaking down between Marina Sirtis and Paramount. As it often does, the crux of the issue came down to money, with Sirtis feeling insulted by the apparent lowball offer given to her. In interviews, Sirtis has spoken extensively about feeling undervalued compared to her male coal stars in particular, and claims that Paramount threatened to put Seven of Nine in the movie in her place if a salary agreement couldn't be reached. Sirtis plithily retorted to the studio, Jerry Ryan don't, won't do it for that money, that's for sure. Thankfully, the matter was eventually resolved, and though Sirtis was ultimately one of the cast's more vocal critics of Nemesis, or to be exact, of Director Baird, she maintains that she was happy with Troy's role in the film. Number 13. The Enterprise ramming into the scimitar was a, mostly, practical effect. Though the previous few Next Generation movies began progressively phasing out practical effects and had deferred to almost entirely digital shots of the Enterprise in action, a practical Enterprise effect was employed in Nemesis for one sequence. When the Enterprise rams the scimitar on Picard's order during the final battle, a practical 17-foot Enterprise saucer was built and collided into a model of the scimitar. The film's production crew shot the effect in slow motion at 360 frames per second to imply a greater sense of heft to the miniatures, and also hung the models upside down so the resulting debris from the clash would fall up as it would in zero gravity. VFX company Digital Domain then added explosions and other ambient elements to the scene, ensuring the end result is a winning marriage of practical and digital effects wizardry. Number 12. An estimated 50 minutes of material was cut. On Nemesis' DVD, Rick Berman claims that roughly 50 minutes of material was cut from the theatrical release in order to achieve a more commercial 117-minute runtime. Though 17 minutes of cut material appears on the DVD, that leaves over half an hour of footage unaccounted for. Most of the cut material was apparently character-centric scenes that fleshed out the relationships of the Enterprise's crew, which were cut to keep the emphasis on the battle between the Enterprise and the Scimitar. 
This includes a far longer wedding sequence in which Picard and Data have a lengthy heart-to-heart, a more involved subplot about Shinzon's obsession with Troy, more scenes with Data and B4, bigger parts for Worf and Dr. Crusher, and a more prolonged epilogue. It's infuriating that so much of this material remains locked away, because much of it sounds like it would have added considerable weight and nuance to a fundamentally threadbare film. Number 11. Jude Law was considered for Shinzon. In the summer of 2001, a few months before shooting was set to begin, rumours did the rounds online that Jude Law had been cast in the role of Shinzon, and though this of course turned out to be untrue, he was indeed in contention for the part. Originally, the plan was to find a name actor who resembled a younger Patrick Stewart to portray Shinzon, and Rick Berman settled on Law. However, director Baird argued that Shinzon should be portrayed by a basically unknown actor, eventually leading to Tom Hardy being cast in the part following an extensive and, by hard Hardy's word, appalling audition process. Part 2. Number 10. Patrick Stewart teared up while shooting his farewell scene. One of the best scenes in the film is the brief but poignant farewell between Picard and Riker as Riker heads off to captain the USS Titan. It isn't overly sentimental, but gives the two characters fitting closure as they go their separate ways. Despite its restraint though, Patrick Stewart struggled to keep his emotions in check during shooting. While filming, Stewart accidentally wept off script and started crying, having been affected by the palpable emotion of it all. As a result, the scene had to be shot again once Stewart regained his composure, and to his credit, you'd never guess he was on the verge of tears in the final version. Number 9. The Climax Went Through Many Changes During Production Nemesis's climax went through numerous changes, both big and small, before shooting began. For starters, a concerted attempt to keep the budget in check meant that the climactic space battle between the Enterprise and the Scimitar was considerably smaller than initially planned. Originally, the space battle featured a Romulan armada, which teamed with the Enterprise to take the Scimitar on, but this was deemed too expensive, and so the Romulan presence was scaled down to just two warbirds. Also, late-stage drafts of the script actually had Data sacrifice himself by shooting a warp core located on the Scimitar's bridge, but long-time Trek technical advisor Rick Sternbach felt that this made no sense, and so the warp core explosion was swapped out for Data shooting the Thaleron generator instead, which was moved to being situated just behind the bridge rather than on it. Number 8. Tom Hardy wore subtle prosthetics to more closely resemble Patrick Stewart. Though there's no mistaking that young Tom Hardy in Nemesis looks pretty damn different from current Tom Hardy, most viewers would simply put that down to the changes that every human face undergoes over the course of like two decades, right? But Hardy's face was actually subtly altered through clever makeup techniques to make him more closely resemble Patrick Stewart. Hardy wore latex prosthetics that were moulded from Stewart's actual face, with latex noses and chins being fitted to Hardy's own. Additionally, because it was felt that Hardy's lips were too plump and full compared to Stewart's, a fake scar was added to draw attention away from them. The effects certainly work, because unlike a lot of sci-fi movie makeup, it's basically invisible to the average viewer's eye. Number 7. A deleted scene introduced Riker's replacement on the Enterprise. One of the most significant sequences is cut from the movie was the introduction of Commander Martin Madden, who was played by Stephen Culp. He would appear at the end of the film as the Enterprise's new first officer, replacing Riker as he takes over the USS Titan. A highly entertaining beat plays out where Madden asks Riker for advice on making a good impression with Picard, only for Riker to insist that he's casual and likes being called Jean-Luc. Naturally, Picard isn't terribly amused when Madden follows Riker's advice, though the scene ends with the clear implication that Madden is a competent officer who will be taken under Picard's wing. It would have been a sweet, uplifting ending to the movie, so its deletion seems completely baffling. Culp later made a canonical appearance in Star Trek, however, by having a five-episode stint in the third season of Star Trek Enterprise as Major Hayes of the Makos. Number 6. The Scimitar was modelled after a lionfish for one special reason. Say what you will about Nemesis, but Shinzon's ship the Scimitar sure is a unique and interesting vessel from a design perspective. It's probably best remembered for the almost animalistic form it takes when deploying its cascading biogenic pulse weapon against the Enterprise at the end of the film. As it turns out, the Scimitar's design was indeed inspired by an animal, a lionfish, which had a distinctive venomous spines protruding from its body in much the same fashion as the Scimitar. It gets even better though, the lionfish wasn't something the ship's designers simply stumbled across, but it served as a nod to the commonalities between Picard and Shinzon. In The Next Generation, Picard had a lionfish named Livingston in his ready room for many years, so it's rather poetically apt that his clone's vessel is modelled after it. That's surely no coincidence. Number 5. LeVar Burton nearly directed the film. 
The director's chair for Nemesis sure was busy before the production finally settled on Oscar-nominated film editor-turned-director Stuart Baird. Initially, Rick Berman approached the Wrath of Khan and Underscored Country director Nicholas Meyer to helm, but Meyer would only agree to come aboard if he could rewrite the screenplay. Berman had to turn Meyer down as he'd already promised writer John Logan full creative control over his script, so Berman then considered offering the job to Geordie LaForge himself, LeVar Burton. By the time Nemesis was preparing to shoot, Burton had directed 20 episodes across the next generation Deep Space Nine and Voyager. And so was certainly an inspired choice following the tradition of Leonard Nimoy, William Shatner and Jonathan Frakes as stars turned directors. However, Paramount ultimately ordered Berman to offer the gig to Baird instead. And with this being the last Trek movie of this era, Burton sadly never got the chance to take the big screen helm behind the camera. Number four, Picard's chair got a seatbelt in a deleted scene. Another amusing part of the deleted epilogue in which Picard is introduced to Commander Madden involves a game-changing alteration to the furniture on the Enterprise bridge. It's been something of a running joke among Trek fans for decades that there are very few situations where anybody ever wears a seatbelt while hurtling through space, the typical explanation being that the ship's inertial dampeners would negate any potentially traumatic acceleration or deceleration. But in this hilarious deleted scene from Nemesis, it was actually revealed that a very special delivery came for Picard, a new ergonomic captain's chair that came complete with a seat belt that he could activate with the mere press of a button. As if to acknowledge the in-joke, Picard says, about time, bringing another welcome moment of light-hearted levity to the movie, albeit one which was, again, left on the cutting room floor. Number three, the Gorn were referenced in the original script. One of writer John Logan's kookier original ideas was to make an amusing reference to the Gorn at Riker's wedding. The Gorn are, of course, the infamous reptilian alien species popularised by the original series episode Arena, where a Gorn has a stiff, clunky battle with Captain Kirk on a rocky planet. In Logan's first draft, Picard's best man speech for Riker included a line about Riker's bachelor party, where Picard said included three Andorians, two Tellarites and a Gorn. For whatever reason, the line was sadly erased before Logan finalised the shooting script, robbing fans of a hilarious sly sliver of fan service. Number two, it's the lowest grossing Star Trek film in history. There's no way to be kind about this. Despite being produced on a not indecent $60 million budget, a whole 10 million less than its predecessor Star Trek Insurrection, due to Patrick Stewart and Brent Spiner both agreeing to take pay cuts, Nemesis was an absolute dud at the box office. It ended up grossing just $67.3 million worldwide, making it the lowest grossing film of the series, pulling in even less than the consensus worst film, Star Trek V The Final Frontier. Additionally, Nemesis was also the first of the 10 Trek films released at that point not to win its opening weekend at the box office, opening a hair behind Jennifer Lopez rom-com Made in Manhattan, which kind of says it all really. Nemesis's catastrophic failure becomes easier to understand when you consider that it was effectively released in a death slot against a number of heavily anticipated blockbusters like Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Die Another Day, and The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. That, combined with a surprisingly low-key marketing campaign and the four-year gap since Insurrection, surely did it no favours at all. Number one, its commercial failure caused a planned sequel to be scrapped. During Nemesis's production, John Logan and Brent Spiner got to work on a script for a potential fifth film starring TNG's cast, which would serve as a concrete farewell to this iteration of the Enterprise crew. The planned film would have apparently been a crossover event involving the Next Generation, Deep Space Nine and Voyager crews, in addition to Riker as Captain of the Titan. Nemesis's atrocious box office performance quickly pumped the brakes on the proposed sequel, though, and so the movie franchise lay dormant for seven years until J.J. Abrams' rejuvenating reboot was released in 2009. With its slicker, broader appeal that Trek 09 became the highest grossing Trek movie at the time, more than doubling second place held by Star Trek First Contact.